opportunity to come and chat with you about you know, one of my favorite things, which would be the graduate students. Um, I guess I want to accomplish a couple of things today. I want to give you a sense of who the graduate students are, what they look like. Um, you may not realize entirely how heterogeneous this group is. And then maybe get you to think a little bit about how the library serves the graduate students how you might do other things to serve graduate students. And at the very end, I'm going to show you some data that we have from our graduate students, uh, giving you some sense of what they think about uh, the library and how it serves them. So the first point I want to make has to do with headcount. Graduate students and professional students, when we lump them together, actually uh, constitute almost 40% of the student body here. And that's something that's, I think, underappreciated by many people. When we think about the 29,000 or so students that we have on campus, over 10,000 of those students are actually graduate professional students, with about 2,500 of that 10,500 being professional students, students who are in the dental school in the DCS program, students who are in the medical school in the MD program, students who are up in pharmacy in the PharmD program, students who are over in the law school, turning JDs. That's the group we consider professional students. And then we've got nearly 8,200 students that we think of as graduate students, students earning master's and uh, PhD degrees. And most of the time when I share this information, people haven't appreciated it graduate student population is quite as big as it is on this campus. So that's the first point I want to leave you with. There are a lot of these students that we need to serve. And then I want to give you some sense of what we think of as a graduate student life cycle. If we start over on the left, then we begin with the process of admission and they go through the standard rigmarole that's required to get admitted into graduate school, and that's followed pretty quickly by matriculation for those students who choose to join us. And then our students, if we stay above the thick blue line, our students spend an indeterminate period of time with us doing research, teaching, and service. Now, of course, the master's programs uh, tend to function for the most part, not all of them, but many of them function pretty much in lockstep. And so we have a sense of how long those students will be with us. And, and many of those programs are based on, on the students being here either 18 months or two years. But those students who are actually earning master's degrees while they go on to a PhD are in a completely different class. And they may be here a much longer time before they earn that master's degree. And of course it takes as I said, an indeterminate period of time to get a PhD. Um, we use that to our advantage when we think about residency for tuition purposes. We don't know how long they're going to be. The other piece of what they're doing, which we often forget about, has to do with professionalization. And those activities are shown below that thick blue line. Um, professionalization is being carried out in the departments but it's also being carried out by the graduate school in conjunction with the Center for Faculty Excellence, the Writing Center, Career Counseling, Student Affairs. In some cases, I suspect the library enters into that. And this is all going on hand in hand with the work the student's doing in the more academic arena, with the idea being at the end of the day, they'll have a job placement. I'm going to say a little bit more about job placements further down the road, but the first thing I want to do is set, set the stage for what I'm going to say. Those of you who think our PhD students all go out to academic careers, that's just not true. I don't know that it ever was true, 
but it's very much not true today, and that's not a bad thing. So something to keep in mind is that a lot of our PhD students go out into careers other than what we would traditionally call academic careers. And they need to be trained for those careers. They need to understand how to find those careers, and uh, they need to have training consistent with those careers. So to give you a sense of where our graduate students are on campus, they're broken out. This is what census looked like last fall uh, in terms of where graduate students were being housed. These are the students who are full-time students on campus pursuing graduate studies. And you can see that there are graduate students in every school other than law. Law is the only school we don't have graduate students in. There is a master's degree in the law school now, but that's handled entirely by the law school. But there are graduate students everywhere else. I'm frequently asked, you mean there are graduate students in the medical school? Yes. There are students earning PhD degrees in the medical school. And there are students earning PhD degrees in pharmacy and in dentistry and in nursing and on every, in every school on this campus with the exception of the law school. You'll also see that the big dogs are arts and sciences and public health. They have by far and away the largest share of graduate students. But we shouldn't dismiss Keenan Flagler or any of the others. They're all doing an important job. Government has a single graduate program, which is why it appears to have so few students. But it's an incredibly important program for the state of North Carolina and certainly for the students enrolled in those programs. So we don't think any of these programs are more important or less important than the others. These are simply the numbers as they exist. So that gives you a sense of the breadth of distribution. A point I really want to make is the fact that graduate students are a lot more heterogeneous than undergraduate students. They are a very different group of individuals. So we'll start with the average age being 31. That's not the average age of an undergraduate student. Then we'll look at the span. We have students enrolled as graduate students ranging from age 18 to 70. And that is not at all the demographic that you look at for undergraduate students. And so that presents interesting challenges, I would say, for the library and for the rest of us on campus. We have a number of individuals who are coming back in their mid-careers to get a graduate credential that they will use to promote themselves in their career, to further what it is that they're doing, Great examples of this are students that come back to get a master's in public health, who have been working in the public health arena for 20 years, but realize they can do more with a master's degree than they can with the bachelor's degree they have, and so at age 45, they come back to get that master's degree and to enhance their careers. Those individuals have a very different sense of what a library is than you all do. And they need help, I think, understanding what a library is today, what a library is designed to do today, and how the library can help them do what it is that they need to do. And I would encourage this group to think about that. A significant fraction of graduate students are married, or they get married while they're students. And many have families with children. I bring that up because that changes the way they think about using the library. Certainly when I was an undergraduate, we went to the library occasionally to get a book, but certainly to socialize. This group of people is not going to the library to socialize. They don't have time for that. And in fact, if they're busy taking care of a family, they don't have time to go to the library. So they need to understand how they can utilize the resources of the library from home. And many of them don't know exactly how to do that or exactly what's available, and they become amazed at when they learn what's available to them electronically and how much they can do from home. They're so busy trying to figure out how to take care of business at home, they have not even had time to think about that. So they use the library very differently. The picture I'm showing here is just a picture of the graduate student population uh, at orientation this past fall. 
And the point I want to make is that they don't look like a homogeneous group of undergraduates. They're a very different group of people. They come in with very different expectations and a very different set of goals. So let's talk a little bit about those goals. In general, the career goals for graduate students are well defined. I've spent a number of years as an academic advisor for undergraduate students. And I certainly met a lot of 18-year-olds who told me their career goals were well defined as well, but I didn't trust any of them. <laughs> and the bulk of them changed over time. That's not so much the case with graduate students. And this is particularly true for students who come in to earn a master's degree that is going to advance their career. Students who may be coming back to get that master's degree. They may be going right on after their baccalaureate, but often they're coming back. Um, so for example, the master's in public health that I talked about to advance their career, the master's in public administration in the school of government. We have government officials from around the state that come back to get an MPA here to advance what they're doing in their local governments within the state. Um, the MFA in dramatic art uh, is another example. These students come in with a very specific career in mind. They know exactly what it is they want to do. They don't want to waste time in getting to that end point and they want to go out and then apply that degree and do what it is that they intend to do. Uh, undergraduates, I would say, not so much. Yes, they want to graduate, but they're not entirely sure of what they're going to do afterwards, and that's fine. The point is that the graduate students are a little different. For these master's students, their focus is often much less on research and far more on application. And we have a tendency to think about all graduate students being focused solely on research. And that's not always the case. There is a large cadre of graduate students out there that are focused a little bit more on application than they are on research. And they, they shouldn't be lost in the mix. Uh, if I look at an entering class of graduate students, here's another number I suspect will surprise some of you. If I look at an entering class, we typically matriculate somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,800 to 2,000 graduate students in the fall of each year. Two-thirds of them are master's students. And I'm not talking about the, the master's students who will go on and earn a PhD are a small portion of those master's students. Only about a third of those students are PhD students who are really focused on a research career. Some of the master's students are, don't get me wrong. But let's not forget that many of the master's students that come in are looking a little more on application and a little less on research. And then, of course, some of our master's students are, in fact, working toward a PhD. And those students tend to be in some of our very traditional disciplines. But that having been said, graduate education as a whole is moving away from conferring a master's before it confers a PhD and moving toward just conferring a PhD. So when I was a graduate student, and it was a while ago, um, there was no master's degree in my area. I have a, a PhD in biochemistry. There was no master's degree. Nobody got a master's degree. Nobody offered a master's degree. You enrolled in a PhD program from the outset. Now that's not true in many of the humanities disciplines today. But it is changing slowly. And many of the students are coming in directly admitted to a PhD program. But we, st we do still have a number of master's students that are working toward a PhD. Uh, but I want you to understand that not all PhD candidates do in fact earn a master's degree. And our PhD degree recipients go into a wide variety of careers. And I would argue that each and every one of those careers is an appropriate career for those students where they're using what they learn. It's just that they're not all in institutions that look like UNC Chapel Hill. Some of them will go on to teach in four-year liberal arts colleges. Some of them will go on to teach in community colleges. Some of them will go into NGOs. Some will go into government settings. They're all making use 
of what they learned to do as graduate students. Just maybe not in the way we have traditionally thought about graduate students moving on. And this isn't a bad thing, this is just a fact. Last fall I had an opportunity to look at some data from our own graduate students. And this is not a scientific sampling. So I'm not going to suggest that, that this is scientific. But I took a look at about a thousand graduate students folks who have graduated from here, but had graduated from here some time ago. These are first placements. These are ultimate placements for these students. And when I took a look, what I saw was that of our PhD students, about 65% were in careers outside the academy, and about 35% were in careers inside the academy. It gives you, and that's not any different than the national average. And so the takeaway from that is we're not always training students to be what, exactly what it is we thought we were training. That doesn't mean we aren't training students to come into academic positions at places like Chapel Hill. We're certainly doing that. We have to continue that. That is part of what we do. But that's not the only thing that we do. Therefore, professional development's a big deal. And this becomes a critically important part of what the training that graduate students receive, receive. Professional development really used to be the purview of the department that the student was in, and still is, to a fair degree. But there's another piece that we're beginning to add on as graduate schools. That piece the departments aren't prepared to do. They weren't trained to do it, they shouldn't be expected to do it, and we're not asking them to do it. We're trying to provide that level that other piece of professional development training, which has become so essential for graduate students to succeed. And the building I'm showing here is a, a building down on uh, Cameron. That's the Graduate Student Center. We hold over 160 workshops and seminars each year down there that serve a significant fraction of <coughs> our students in providing a variety of things that contribute to their overall professional development. Uh, just something for you folks as library members to think about. I don't know how the library can participate in this, but I'd love to hear about it. If there's a way the library can really jump in and help us with this, we'd be delighted. And we're more involved in what I'll call career guidance, not career placement, career guidance, than we have been in the past. We're trying to get our graduate students to think from the beginning about their career and to think about the skills they're going to need to develop while they're graduate students in addition to the skills, they do, the academic skills that they develop um, so that as they see careers in these ever-expanding markets. We know from studies that have been done across the country that there's a there's kind of a place about three years into a PhD, three or four years into a PhD where a reasonable fraction of students that were absolutely committed to going to a place like Chapel Hill <coughs> And have second thoughts and begin to think maybe that's not exactly what I want to do. First of all, I mean the first question they're always asking is, is that okay? And they get a mixed response to that and then they're trying to figure out what to do about that. And I'm talking about students who have decided that they don't want to look like their mentor. They want to look a little different. Maybe they want to go teach at Davidson. Maybe they want to work in a national lab. Maybe they want to do policy analysis for a think tank. All of these are viable careers that they may or may not have been exposed to that they begin to think about. Um, we've re-energized our partnership with Career Services um, to help us help the students think about the opportunities that are available to them out there. And this isn't, this isn't just driven by the difficulty in obtaining academic positions. That's out there and we can't deny that. But we're talking about students who actually never wanted to go to that <coughs> academic position. They wanted to do something else and trying to make that a realistic goal for them. Um, I want to share with you some, very briefly, some exit survey results. A little over a year ago, the graduate school started to do an exit survey 
And this is an exit survey required of all our graduating students, masters and doctoral students. We have about a 96 or 97 percent completion rate on this exit survey. Um, there are two reasons for that. First of all, I believe this date is incredibly important for us to move forward. Therefore, I've made it mandatory for students to graduate. <laughs> uh, that's how we get that high, because it's not, there are no real tricks here, it's just we have made it mandatory because we believe it's essential to have it. And it's a survey that takes the students about 30 to 40 minutes to fill out, and we found the data to be invaluable. I'm going to give you snapshots of some big picture things and then some library specific things. So 78% of our graduate students rated their overall experience here as very good or excellent. We think that's very nice. 78% rated satisfaction with the academic experience as well. So these are all really, I have to tell you, they, the results turned out better than I had thought they might. I'm delighted that the students are, feel like their experience here is good. 77% um, have indicated they was, would choose Chapel Hill again, and maybe even more importantly, 82% would recommend UNC to somebody else. So we're really doing very well. And what this survey allows us to do is focus on those things where we're not doing as well. The overall satisfaction is pretty good. There are areas where we're not doing as well. Now, I want to give you a sense of how the library looks. And I'm going to preface this with the library looks very good. But that doesn't mean that more can't be done. Um, we do have a very specific library question. And I know the writing on this is a little small, but I, I'm going to direct you to a couple of things. First of all, if you will look sort of in the top half of this over on the right-hand side, you will see that this is a compilation of about a 1,000 responses. So Could this is. Maybe less live. I'm is sorry? Is less live an option? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Oh, perfect. That should go. Um, this is about a thousand responses, so we're not talking about a small survey. At this point, this is a pretty good number of students. We don't have this year's data in yet. Um, what I want to direct your attention to is what's in red. These are percentages, either very good, with a very good or excellent rating, to the question, rate the adequacy of support you were provided with regard to the library and electronic research resources. We have it disaggregated slightly in terms of uh, divisions, the basic and applied sciences, health affairs, humanities, etc. Each one of those divisions is pretty much the same, although there's some, I think, important differences. Um, the overall ranking is pretty consistent with what you see in the individual disciplines. And there's, you know, an 80 plus percent satisfaction rate with what the library is up to. I think that speaks very well of what the library is doing. And it doesn't seem to fall off particularly in one area or another. Um, if the library was interested in adding a question or two to this survey, to get at very specific issues that they wanted to have addressed by graduate students. This is our survey, we can do that. And we would be more than delighted to get a couple of additional questions on the survey which ask more specific things about the library. As I said, we've just begun doing this. This is a routine piece of what graduate students do and it provides a vehicle to understand what's working and what's not working and where needs are going unfulfilled um, with regard to a variety of things and this happens to be the library specific question. So as I was thinking about this, a couple of things that come to my mind with regard to the library and our graduate students. The first has to do with a lack of understanding of plagiarism. I don't know whether the library needs to jump into this I don't know who best can address this. I guess I have a feeling that multiple venues need to address plagiarism and make it clear this is a particular problem for our international students, but it's certainly not restricted to our international students. And it's compounded by 
the digital world that we live in today, which has made it even more difficult in, at times to distinguish between plagiarizing and not plagiarizing. I have a pretty old-fashioned view that I'm pretty sure doesn't get me into trouble. But my students challenge me about it all the time, and I'm never sure where that line lies. And it's not, not with regard to taking the written word off the web. It has to do with typically figures, drawings, and you know, some sort of digital conceptualization of a process. And where is it appropriate to take something from somebody else with attribution, and where should the student actually put some energy and effort into doing it themselves? And how do you attribute those things? These are the sort of things that, that we run into all the time. Then the other piece I've already alluded to. I think many of our students don't know how to effectively use a modern library. And I would hope the library would be thinking about that in a way to help those students learn how to use, uh, effectively use a modern library. And I'm using the word effectively and modern um, very purposefully. The library today is very different from the library that I grew up with. And that's a good thing. But how do you effectively utilize those resources? How do you know what's there? Yeah, I have this, this story I love to tell, and I'm going to unfortunately bore you with this, but it gives you a sense. I had an undergraduate student actually in my lab a couple of years ago. We experienced a power failure. He had a paper due the next day. He said, my god, what am I going to do? The power's gone down. I said, what's the problem? He said, I need a PDF. And I said, well, the health sciences library is, you know, 500 feet in that direction. Go up there. He said, the power will be out there, too. How's that going to help? <laughs> and I said, well, they have the germ. He said, they do? You know, look at it. He really had no sense of that connection. And that's what I'd hope we could give to graduate students to teach them how to use all those resources more effectively. I'm not going to say I know how to use a library effectively. I think we can all benefit from that. So thanks very much for uh, letting me tell you a little bit about graduate students. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and we'd be delighted to listen to the rest of the conversation. I think we have a question over here. Actually. Hi. Um, I'm Heather Jenner. I'm coordinator of assessment for the University of Library. So I'd be very interested in talking to you about the exit survey. Perfect. We should talk more. Shoot me an email and we'll find a time to chat because I'd love to. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think we, you know, we'd love to get something on there more than just this overall satisfaction question. That's a good place to start. Yeah. And that was about as much as we knew to ask. Right. <laughs> That's a good question. Now we need help. <laughs> yeah, and looking at, I just kind of quickly went online to look at your workshops at the Graduate um, Center, and I definitely think we can probably work with you folks to come up with a couple things around plagiarism or uh, basic research. Then, then this has been really yeah, beneficial. So. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely yeah. great. That's, so that's we should terrific. Talk more about so that. we should talk more about that. Good. Yeah. I just had a question. You were comparing uh, not the graduate population with the graduate population. With yeah. The number. Do you know? Do you have a data about the value of the race and gender? If it matches? Yeah, actually, it's so. That's a really good question, and I was very interested in that. So let's talk about gender first. Mm -hmm. So the gender of the graduate population mm -hmm. looks just like the gender of the undergraduate population. Mm -hmm. I don't think I expected that. But that's what it looks like. So it's about 60% women and 40% men. So the gender looks about the same. Um, the race <coughs> is similar to the undergraduate population. Um, there are no massive differences there. But, but there are small differences and, and critical differences. We've still got pipeline issues into graduate school for black students, for Hispanic students, and for uh, American Indian students and the populations aren't as robust as we'd like them to be. And we're continuing to try to work on that. Where we're very different than the undergraduate population is in international students. So about 12% of the graduate population is international. And it's much lower for the undergraduate population. And there are political reasons for that. I mean, with an 85% or an 82% rather cap, um, an 18% cap actually on out-of-state admits, it, it makes it much more difficult to admit international students at the undergraduate level. They exist, but it's harder. There's no such cap at the graduate level. 
So we have a larger international population there. Does that get at what you yeah. were after? Yeah. I, I, to tell you the truth, I was surprised by the gender. You know, we have this notion that more men go to graduate school than women. Not true. Last year, in the biological sciences, more PhDs were awarded to women than to men. PhDs. Not bachelor's degrees, not master's degrees, PhD degrees. Now, we're not to the place that we need to get to in the faculty yet, given those numbers. But we have to be marching in that direction, because that's what the pools are going to look like into the future. And we do have uh, about 60% women in the graduate population, just like the undergrad population. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Melanie Lackey, and I'm the liaison from the Library of the School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. So when I see your people up here that they don't know how to use them, services are provided. I do a lot of consultations and I do a lot of teaching on what the library does. Mm -hmm. For us though, it's a question of capacity. It's not a question of ah. not wanting to. It's that there's one of me for 1,400 of them and eight programs. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I'd love to get help with you so that as often as possible. And I know that this also happens in other libraries as well. So do you have any suggestions for how to meet those needs, because it's well, constantly a question. Uh, it, it, the the only suggestion that comes immediately to mind was, is there a way to clone you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, or minions. They would work great, too. Well, minions, of course. Minions cost money. <laughs> no, no, they don't. Well, <laughs> um, you know, trying to put what you're doing out in a broader format, in a workshop format. I mean, one of the things that we, we haven't done this, but we toyed with the idea of podcasts or videos of some kind that might help, certainly workshops. Um, but if there's a way to do some of that, we'd certainly be interested in, in helping to think about that. That's a good point, that there's just not enough of you to teach them what they need to know. I work over at eResources and Serials Management, and I have to say it's really exciting to see so many of you here. This is a fantastic turnout, and we really appreciate your interest. Um, we have four doctoral students here who have kindly obliged in uh, serving on this panel, um, offering to answer some questions for us. Um, thank you guys for your time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, to start, could you all just um, tell us your name, what program you're in, how far along you are, and maybe just a little about your research. Uh, I'm Maggie Kovac. I'm in the geography department, and I'm one of those masters and PhD students. So I've just completed my masters, and I'm now in my PhD. Hello, I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm in the School of Public Health in the Department of Health Behavior, where I am early on in the, I would call it the natural history rather than the life cycle of a grad student, <laughs> <laughs> for us due to the public health training there. Uh, and I went through the master's program about three years ago and was a university employee for the last three years. And I'm now back at my first year of PhD. So we're working on tobacco marketing at the point of sale. I'm Joseph Eva. I'm a doctoral candidate in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And Stephanie Brown is the director of our library. I'm in my third year of the program. And my specific area of research deals with the relationship between media representation of racial minority and racial minority students' academic experiences on the university what, what universities. Uh, my name is Rob Shepard. I am I'm ABD in the history department. Um, I, uh, my, my, my research interest is um, environmental history, uh, focusing on the American South. Uh, the topic has to do with the Longleaf Pine Forest and the reactions and, and perceptions that people had as the, the lonely forest declined across the south. And um, uh, I have two kids, I'll throw that out there, so I am mm -hmm. part of that, but that team that's what was describing. Thank you so much. Can I ask you a quick question? Is everybody involved here with, with the library in some manner? Yes. Okay. Um, everyone here is library staff of some kind. Okay. So, good Thank question. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first of all, just to start off, um, now we of course as library staff would always like to imagine that you're doing your work in the library and 
that we're serving you in that way, but we know that's not really the case. Can you tell us a little bit about where you find yourself doing your work? I know for me, I usually do it in um, my office. So electronically, I'm just library more than I actually do going in and using it. So electronic resources are very important to me. That and the kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and forth actually. When I first started the program, the concept of clicking on an icon to have a book delivered to you was foreign to me. So I spent a lot of time going back and forth to the library. And I thought that could be so easy to even use that icon. <laughs> <laughs> but now I will pay for it. <laughs> it makes me feel. But, uh, sometimes I do, especially like if something, uh, if I'm looking for a book for a reference that I I don't have any specifics, I just want to have the general area. I'll go into the library, ask you know, to go into the, the stacks, and look at the books around there. I'll also go, I need to get out of my office, sometimes I just need to get in Then I'll go to Wilson, in the quiet room in Wilson, to just work quite a But I do a lot online, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan, and I'll tell myself, a big user of the online libraries. I don't know detailing if you want to call it the if I'm not on the day one asking them for what I really use or ask them for a scan, so I use it a lot, I use it. That particular service is special. The PDFs, I'm not a PDF person. <laughs> <laughs> um I I am pretty much in my carol in Davis four or five uh, almost every day, at least four days a week. Um, that just seems to work better just to remove myself, speaking of the kids, removing myself from that, from the home setting for the most part. Uh, and when I'm there, I'm either, um, you know, on my laptop in the Carol accessing things electronically as you described, or, you know, roaming into the, the stacks in Davis. Um, but certainly a heavy, heavy emphasis on electronic access in, in as many avenues um, the, uh, I, I do go over to, the, I think I recognize you maybe from the science library, I do go over uh, uh, there uh, a good bit to um, tap into things like forestry research. Um, I have been in the information library sciences library as well, to a less, to a much smaller extent, the law library and the Stone Center library. I'll stop there. Yep. No, fantastic. It's good to hear about how you've been in so many of these places. I haven't been to the Stone Center Library. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's great have, hearing how, you know, Rob, um, yeah, Rob, you spend so much of your time, you know, in these different libraries, in your Carol and Davis, whereas others of you spend most of your time using library resources online in their offices at the kitchen table. Um, for those of you who do, well, for all of you, um, how often do you find yourselves using print materials? If at all. I do, I still like to read the print. Uh, so it depends on, on how I'm going to the article. If I know the article is really relevant to what I'm doing, I'm going to decide it out, I'll print it, and then I'll make notes on it. But then I realized that the free version of Adobe you can highlight in there, <laughs> and you can leave comments, just like the IRB people do. <laughs> I noticed that. The last two, three months I've been using this book. But again, it's an article that I go up to the site map, it's going to be a new me, but I want it to make it single sided even. I don't want to give it to the other side of the company. But it's still, you still got to it electronically? Yes. Okay. How about you, Suzanne? I'm about the same. I like Yeah, I use the electronically, but if I'm going to cite it a lot, um, use it in a journal article or something else, I'll open it up. Doing a fair number of systematic reviews, I get like all these PDFs, so I just keep them in that format. But occasionally, I have some project that has a little more historical piece to it that gets older, and sometimes I'll go through that once or through all the index medic because it's, it's not right. <laughs> index medic, kind of whatever. Um, the uh, health sciences library looked up articles from a long ago. It was very sure, sure. So you're finding those articles actually in the print volume? It does not. I don't know if um, if it's my age or my you know being in the history department, but I find that um, uh, 
it sounds like maybe I, I tend to use just you know, secondary works and from Davis or the other library, you know, the books from the shelf um, quite frequently. Also, I want to say that I, um, I'm a massive, obviously I'm a huge fan of Wilson Library and the Southern Historical Collection, the mm -hmm. North Carolina Collection. Um, so I guess those, uh, anything that's dig digitized is, uh, I, um, is fantastic. I, um, I know they're doing a lot of that and I certainly uh, am thrilled about that and love and anything that can be done to enhance digitization of those kind of manuscript collections and other materials. Um, but I do still like to you know, go there and, and get my hands on uh, those, those primary sources as well. So, so I hear a lot of you sort of starting to talk about your, your process for you know, when you're doing literature review. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what that process looks like when you're writing a paper, working on a dissertation, what have you? What does that process look like for finding sources and incorporating that into your work? Wherever you want to. <laughs> well, I always start with a general search. You know, with those uh, e search tools that you have and there's no specific fields. So, the one I use that is communication and mass media. And the big search from this, I can go to all the two more searches. Then, from there, get the relevant articles. And then, what I do a lot actually, once I have a dozen articles that I think are interesting, I just go straight to their reference list. You can see if there are other references, mm -hmm. or if I see some authors coming up, some works being cited over and over, so it gives you a sense of the importance. I need to use the cited tool more often. I'm still gonna, not used to it, I guess. That's how I do. And then, just like I described before, depending on the relevance of the article, I'll keep it or keep it on, on the desktop of the computer. I did stop, I want to say, I did stop using RefWorks just because I was not happy with the, the way I was doing my citations. Now I'm doing all my citations by hands. <laughs> and I'm very, happy. <laughs> I'm very happy, I don't get as much anymore. Uh, last semester for my proposal I had more than 20 pages of citations all by hand. I was happy with it because when I work was frustrating to me. And then the idea of knowing that when I would leave UNC, I would have to somehow back up this data on those articles anyway. And then I want to do the work twice. So mm -hmm. I still have many, many, many articles. But I'm going to stop using it. So now I have more folders that I need to do. So yeah, maybe that's a process also that I've changed. That's a five years ago, I'm getting away. That mattered. Ah, the thought of all this typing has out. No, I mean, so. I'd say I spend time on the PubMed database like every day, like at least one or two articles. I actually think in this sort of from one of your earlier questions, I probably interact with the library more than any other part of campus other than transit and my actual department. So like you guys, I mean, to a certain extent, are my main source of institutional communication in a lot of ways. Um, and so, and a lot of that though is just through the databases and through PubMed, some of it is like, you know, direct consultation or the Ask Library service, and occasionally I use your chat, chat feature. Um, and then it sort of all accumulates in my EndNote uh, database, and I kind of, you know, sometimes I just pull things that I've already looked at back out of EndNote and into my papers, but it starts So my research um, process is pretty similar. Um, I use Google Scholar just to research. Um, but what's different for me is, is in geography, I use a lot of GIS. So I use the library for a lot of data, like census data. Um, the GIS data finder is tremendously useful. Amanda Henley helps out a lot. So um, that's what makes my research process different, is I go to the library to get some of the data I need for my research. Um, can you remind me what 
what would you like to know? Yeah, tell us a little bit about your research oh. process. How do you end up finding sources and um, Well, I, I used to work at a newspaper, and you know, one of, the, one of the things you hear is you don't really want to see, it's like, I guess it's like a lot of professions, it's like making sausage, you don't want to see it being done, and that was true <laughs> for journalism, and it's probably too true for my research. Process. It's pretty, pretty, in some ways, it's pretty random, which sometimes you know leads to those the serendipity factor of finding the source just by luck. Um, I don't think it's maybe not too different from what um, the other folks have described. Um, I, I definitely, you know, once I once you have a handful of really important sources, those for me tend to be. Um, uh, sort of for monographs, but um, then I'm immediately looking at the, the references or the bibliographies and looking for you know other sources to follow up on. And sometimes those are um, articles from, that I find through JSTOR. JSTOR is, another, is one of the big frequently used e-research tools for me. You know, um, that tends to be some electronic pursuits and some books from the shelf, from the shelves, and it just kind of continues to build from there, yeah. So I noticed a couple of you mentioned talking to librarians on the course of your research, and there is no right or wrong answer to this question, there is no <laughs> right or wrong answer, but, um, but how have you interacted with librarians, if at all, in the course of doing your research? I would say I touch base with Stephanie at least every other week. It's always a question of you know, is this something that I can find or something new, especially when something new that just came out. I'll send an email to Stephanie. This article just came out, do we have it already? Give me a couple of weeks. Also, anything. I mean, a lot of it also, I was teaching too. This is not my teaching, but when I was teaching, I was in contact with her a lot. She came to the class, she did some presentation, telling students how to work for their final resource project. So that helped a lot, she was always a very good part of contact. But I have to say that I've been very, very impressed by the speed of response and the quality of service that at least I personally have received from any librarian in the park, particularly when given here this general. I have this question, I don't even have to worry about it. I know I will get answered. <laughs> I have a similar, uh, let me just second that. Definitely um, incredibly positive interactions, whether it's in Davis, talking to people there. Um, I, need to use, I need to talk to people more at the reference desk in Davis, or um, you know, whether it's talking to people in, in Wilson library as well, and I have used the, is it the, the I am, the online chat, which I really, I think that's fantastic. I don't know, how, I don't know if that's, if y'all like that, but I certainly find it very um, incredibly useful. How about you guys? I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm oh, trying no. to take over here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say no more words, keep going. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, it's been really interesting to see what kind of when I'm starting a research project, I usually contact um, Michelle or Amanda Henley and just talk about data availability, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. and, um, a lot of the data, particularly the census data, because I'm a physical geographer, I deal with more of the earth science stuff. I don't know a lot about it, and they can explain it to me, tell me if it's possible, um, what I envision, and I just really make the beginning stages of the research project um, much easier. They're always easily accessible. Here. I am. Um, so I want to leave some time for you all to ask questions, as I'm sure you have many. Um, we scheduled this until 12, and we want to respect your time. I'm sure some of us would sit here all afternoon, but um, <laughs> but feel free to. Uh, we'll finish up at 12, and if people want to hang around and ask more questions, you are open to that. We'll see what happens. But um, does anyone have you have questions? Would you find most problematic or frustrating? bad answer to that question, but when I was thinking about which parts of, when, but when I think about which parts of campus I interact with most, I 
mean, it's you and my department followed by like IT and the grad school, basically. And I mean, I have lists of complaints about grad school <laughs> and the admissions process and the financial aid process and the IT process. But the library process actually seems to work really well. And uh, compare, I worked at Duke before I worked at Carolina before I came back to school. And I think you all compare really well against them to being able to provide me with good information when I need it related to the work of my job. Yeah. I had my first not so positive experience a couple of weeks ago. And it dealt with an article I was trying to find, which, according to UNC Library, I should have had access to it. But the scan and pages kept repeating themselves over 17, 17, 18, 18, 18. So I just made a request, you know, stating that was the problem, that it was available, but the scan was not working. And then I received an email two weeks ago saying, well, you know, we found it, and there was only one page this time. And I went to tell the like, well, did it work? And they, I don't know, did they believe me? Or anyway, <laughs> this time, but, well, we sent it to me, should I receive it? And I received it, it was a couple of eventually it got solved. So to tell you, that's my less positive experience, I'm still in the other the article. <laughs> so. I've, I've been, before we came, I've been kind of racking, thinking, trying to think hard about something I would complain about, and the only thing I came up with is the, uh, this is a serious one, this third floor men's room of Davis. <laughs> it's, it's, it's um, this is just a side note, but I don't know if, if this is part of budget, you know, budget issues, but um, there are times I don't know if you guys end up there at all, but there are times <laughs> you guys <laughs> when it's really, really pretty bad. Pretty just, just in terms of, it seems like it needs more of a more regular cleaning. I don't know. That may be something that could be pursued, but um, I guess that's a good sign that we uh, don't have any, any major problems. Uh, I also wanted to advocate for inter interlibrary loan. Uh, that's been incredibly valuable and efficient and um, useful for me. And my only um, complaint, it's hard to find one, is um, computer availability. A lot of students in geography do their labs last minute, and the GIS computers will be filled. Someone will have a problem. They'll ask for an extension. So just more resources. I actually work in Interlibrary you know, Loan, and so I'm glad to hear that. I don't know if anybody else has anything positive yeah. or negative to say about Interlibrary Loan. Or if you've not used it, why not? I'm serious. No, I'm very happy with it. Actually, when I see a book that I want that's in use, I will use Interlibrary Loan. As long as I was available, I don't want to recall that person. Oh, that's fine. So, I'm very happy. The loss of the $5 fee is amazing. That's outside. Oh, I was sorry, Is it is it possible to like overuse interlibrary loan? Sometimes I wonder <laughs> if I am abusing the privilege. You know? In my experience, the only people that do that are the people that don't have the consideration to ask. So I think the fact that you're completely fine. Okay. There are, there are very few people who have been using this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question over here. Um, those of you who mentioned particular databases that you go to a lot, how did you first, how did those databases first come to your attention? <laughs> I think JSTOR, JSTOR was recommended by, I think, a history professor in one of my early classes and then the others I think personally I, I found you know went to the e, e research tools on the website <coughs> the frequently used I really still haven't explored all the other kinds of databases but the frequently used I think you mentioned that as well have been that's how I got there. Stephanie Brown has a workshop at the beginning of every semester for different group of students and that's how I heard the contact Some of mine are left over from undergrad. I think in advice from professors there, but others are from the orientation that Melanie does for public health students. Yeah, mine are from early classes. I just exploring on my own. 
I'm just curious with all your, do you use Lime Catalog at all? And secondly, do you use Facebook or people to meet with librarian? I use the catalog when I can't find something in, when I'm having trouble getting to the actual PDF. Sometimes I have to go from the e-journals e and go back through the library, through the catalog to see if that will link me to it better, or if it's just to see if it's in you know, paper here. Um, but I have not used either Facebook or Twitter. I use both, but not with librarians. I also use the catalog now. Since I gave up rest work, I also use the catalog to cite books. Uh -huh. I can just copy paste the uh, yeah. publishing house. Yes, yes. Too, me too. Yes. I use the publishing house. That's how I, I always get some problem with the language. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I use the catalog. So would you think Google Left work doesn't work? It doesn't work for me. <laughs> You're not a bot. <laughs> you just can't. You're not a bot. Oh. You have this comment. I use the uh, catalog, yes, frequently. I do as well. I didn't know Facebook and Twitter were available. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is specifically a library question, but are there ways that you tend to, uh, places that you tend to look for information or uh, receive information about things happening around the university that might be of interest to you? And social media was raised a little bit, so that might be one channel. Are there newsletters? Is it Correspondence or information from the department. What sort of catches your attention on a day-to-day basis? I actually read all the emails on the research. So mm -hmm. I'm on different research, and I would read them. That's something that catches my attention or flag it. And then when I have more time, I go back to it and actually read it more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. Just people. Okay. You got swamped under the research. I, I take time every day to at least read my emails. I always read the School of Public Health's weekly news email, which there are two. And then I pay attention to their big flat screen monitors in the atrium of the School of Public Health. Other than that, if it's not on the front page of UNC Today, The library has a text to librarian reference service where you can text us questions, and we don't get very much use of this um, for whatever reasons. So do you have any suggestions of how we could advertise this better to students or um, ways that we could just get the word out or ways that we could boost usage? Pick on your, your website if you have a question. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you need how to data question your own website for people? It's easier to type on. Well, if you don't have access to your computer, That's related to the previous uh, presentation. Talk about generalization, or I shouldn't say that, summarize about graduate student having more or less focus on research, but more on application. I wonder would you like to comment on that? I'm not quite sure I fully understand that. You know, what does that describe to your research process? As far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm focused 90% on research. I tend to always frame my research questions in a way that there is some kind of tangible real-world application to it, but it's not, I'm not really learning an actual skill. Mm -hmm. And I think I speak for most of the doctoral students in the journalism school. Carolina's state government tobacco prevention programs 
and trying to, to get research knowledge out being used into, into actual practice, which means it, I mean, it, it has to be changed in format, practically, practically content, to be really helpful on the ground. So spend a fair amount of time trying to sort of take that knowledge and apply it in the field in public health, which I mean, it differs depending on who you are in the School of Public Health, which department you're in somewhat. But yeah, there's definitely an interesting balance between the things I do that are purely about like research for research sake, which is not a whole lot, and things that I do that are much more supposed to have a practical impact on the public health systems and policies around the state. So that may be a little bit field specific mm -hmm. to a certain extent, but there's sort of a balance there. Um, I guess for me, um, I have a research fellowship with uh, NOAA, Southeast Regional Climate Center. Um, so my research questions are how can I advance, you know, Southeast climate services? And uh, a lot of uh, our research ends up on the web for them. So that's the application I have in my own work. I, I guess I, I, mine is probably more, I don't know, tradition, traditionally academic, I guess in some ways. Uh, it's leading toward, you know, doing the dissertation and then turning, you know, improving that into a book, uh, you know, a, a monograph. It, it, I almost feel like the, the I, kind of the undercurrent is you want it to have not necessarily practical application. You certainly want it to have a connection to current concerns, but at the same time, you're almost kind of supposed to act like you don't care about that kind of thing. You know, you're um, well, even, yeah, you're a little bit detached and you know, maybe not have as such presentist concerns, but that's not quite as strict as, you know, there's there's some, that's a permeable, well, I'll stop there. You know what I'm, I hope you know what I'm saying. Well, we have reached time, so again, thank you all so much for being here. We are so appreciated. <laughs> Also, thank you to Dean Matson again for his comments. Have a good day.